on the 4th of October 1999, 25 years ago, the revolutionary documentary series Walking with Dinosaurs was released. Fans of my channel may be aware that I already reviewed this series 5 years ago for its 20 year anniversary. Long story short, I made those videos during the darkest period in my personal life and I was far less experienced in video making and it really shows in those reviews, especially the first two. In this video, I wanted to revisit this amazing show and go over many of the things I didn't address in my initial analysis videos. The story of Walking with Dinosaurs starts with the one and only Tim Haynes. Haynes had graduated from Bangor University with a bachelor's degree in Applied Zoology in 1982 and was a scientific journalist for the BBC. Having been inspired by the film Jurassic Park in 1993, he wanted to bring dinosaurs to life on the small screen in the form of a traditional nature documentary. He eventually pitched the idea to the BBC. Whilst executives were very interested in the idea, they were nervous about funding the project due to it requiring a lot of expensive CGI. Their solution was to have Tim film a pilot episode in Cyprus in the spring of 1997 and to have Mike Milne's team at the animation and visual effects studio, Framestore, add in the computer generated creatures later. The pilot ended up at around 6 minutes long and was based on fossil finds from the Jurassic aged Oxford clay formation in England, starring the dinosaurs Eustreptus bondylus and Cetiosaurus, the marine reptiles Lyplurodon and Cryptoclidus, and an unidentified flying pterosaur. This pilot was likely adapted into the third episode of the series, Cruel Sea, with the scene of the Lyplurodon becoming beached making it into the final product. With a budget of £100,000, the pilot went down as a success with BBC executives and also the Discovery Channel, with both funding the project, giving the crew a total budget of £6 million, with Tim Haynes acting as director and executive producer for the project, named Walking with Dinosaurs, apparently after Tim Haynes misremembering the name of the film Dances with Wolves. The crew gathered various producers from the BBC to work on the show, the most noteworthy being Jasper James, who would go on to become a series producer for future shows in the Walking With series, such as Walking With Beasts and Sea Monsters. These two would later go on to found their own independent production company, Impossible Pictures, in 2002. Filming began in the summer of 1997 in locations that most closely resembled the flora that lived during the age of the dinosaurs to form the backdrops the CGI creatures would later be added on top of. The show consists of six episodes, each set during different stages of the Mesozoic era, showcasing both the evolution and day-to-day -day lives of dinosaurs and the many creatures they shared their world with. The production crew wisely decided to base the episodes on the most well-understood fossil sites from around the world to allow for more interesting stories and the most accurate depictions of extinct creatures as possible for the time, with input from several scientists on how to reconstruct them and how they would have behaved. However, in the 25 years since the show was made, new discoveries and advancements in the field of paleontology have since made the show outdated in many ways. Without further ado, let's analyse each episode individually and evaluate the scientific accuracy of Walking with Dinosaurs 25 years later. Episode 1, New Blood, first aired on the 4th of October 1999. It is set 220 million years ago in the Late Triassic period, even though the narration erroneously refers to it as the Mid-Triassic sometimes, in Arizona, and based on fossil finds from the Chinle Formation, at least for the most part, but I'll talk more about that later. It was filmed at the Madeline Waterfalls and presumably nearby areas around the Yate River in New Caledonia. Skipping the wonderful time travel opening sequence, the story starts out in what is presumably the northwestern edge of the central Pangaean Desert, an enormous desert in the centre of the supercontinent Pangaea, a conglomerate of all the world's major landmasses and whose landlocked centre receives so little water from the surrounding global ocean, Panthalassa, it is a huge arid desert. 
The narration states that the Triassic has already seen many different varieties of ancient reptiles come and go, which is correct. The Triassic is famous for being the period following the greatest mass extinction event at the end of the previous Permian period, colloquially known as the Great Dying, and the ensuing niche vacuum created by over 90% of all species becoming extinct allowed room for the survivors to experiment with many different forms due to the lack of competition. I have a whole video on many of these strange creatures if you're interested in learning more. A link will be in the description. However, the most influential group of reptiles to evolve in the Triassic were, of course, the dinosaurs. As such, the first creature we are properly introduced to is the early dinosaur, Coelophysis. Its name means hollow form, after its hollow, bird-like vertebrae. Many specimens and species have been referred to Coelophysis, many of which are from the early Jurassic, but these are heavily debated. The type species, C. bauri, is definitively known from the late Triassic Chinle formation. With that said, the oldest known Coelophysis remains are found in the Petrified Forest member, dated to 215 to 208 million years ago, 5 million years after the setting of the episode at the earliest. The less well-known related genus Camposaurus was found in the older Blue Mesa member, dated from 224 to 215 million years ago, and would be a more appropriate candidate chronologically. The producers most likely picked Coelophysis as it was much more completely known, and Camposaurus was only named in 1998, when the show was well into production already. Regardless, it fills the role of essentially the archetypal carnivorous theropod, one of the three major lineages of dinosaurs. As for the model itself, whilst it was fantastic at the time, as to be expected of a documentary that's two and a half decades old, it is quite outdated now, understandably. But that's not a bad thing. If anything, it's a testament to how far our knowledge has expanded since 1999, and is in no way a detractor of the show. With that said, the Coelophysis, as well as many of the dinosaur models in the show, suffer from many tropes of dinosaur reconstructions of the time. A prevalent one is shrink wrapping, best seen on the wonderful head puppet. The fenestrae, the holes in the skull, are very prevalent, whereas we now believe they would be mostly obscured by soft tissues and life. Otherwise though, both it and the CG model match the fossil skull very closely, and the entire animal, honestly. With that being said, all of the individuals look the same, when Coelophysis has two adult morphs, a gracile one and a robust one, speculated to be females and males respectively, making it a sexually dimorphic genus, or they are simply cases of individual variation. Whilst they're incorrectly shown to be capable of pronating their hands downwards, which the theropod wrists were unable to do, I was impressed to see that the digits were correct, as whilst it had four fingers, the fourth was tiny and vestigial, possibly even being embedded in the flesh of the hand. The feet also seem to be correct, with three weight-bearing toes and one vestigial toe. They do technically have a fifth toe, but it was only a single small bone embedded in the flesh that was reduced from the ancestral archosaur five-toed foot that later theropods would lose entirely. Archosaurs being the group of reptiles including crocodilians, dinosaurs, birds, and all animals more closely related to them than to other reptiles. It is debated whether Coelophysis and indeed other Triassic dinosaurs had feathers. A paper from 2022 reports that there is strong evidence for polar ice from near the North Pole from China dated to the Triassic-Jurassic boundary. These are thought to have been caused by volcanic winters from the erupting Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, which are suspected to have caused the end Triassic extinction. The paper suggests that dinosaurs were able to thrive in the cooler polar climates due to having insulating feathers, whereas other large non-insulated reptiles died out. This and feathered dinosaurs in general were not really known about during the time of production though. It is later shown to be cannibalistic. This was based on a fossil that showed an adult Coelophysis with what was assumed to be a juvenile in its stomach region. This, however, was later reinterpreted as a small crocodile relative. 
Whilst there is no longer any direct evidence of cannibalism, it is entirely possible Coelophysis ate its own kind on occasion, as modern predators sometimes do. The next creature we meet is Placerias. The narration refers to it as an ancient type of reptile, when it was actually a synapsid, the broader group that includes all animals more closely related to mammals than reptiles. It was long thought that synapsids evolved from ancient reptiles, hence why they were long given the common name mammal-like reptiles. However, it is now understood that reptiles and synapsids both descend from more basal tetrapods, that is, four-legged vertebrates, and so synapsids are not reptiles at all. The show was made around the time when these terms were being made more clear, so I suppose I can let it slide. As for Placeria specifically, its name means broad body, and it was a dicynodont, a very successful and widespread group of herbivorous synapsids that evolved in the previous Permian period, and were among the few survivors of the Permian extinction. The narration refers to it as an endangered species, as at the time it was thought to be the last dicynodont. This has since been overturned by the discovery of other dicynodont species from younger Triassic rocks, such as Lysowicia from Poland and Pentasaurus from South Africa. The narration implies that Coelophysis hunt ill Placerias, but there are two issues with this. The first is that Placeria seem like they'd be too massive for such a gracile dinosaur to take down. The second is that the two may never have met. Placerias is known from a bone bed, referred to as the Placerias Quarry, thought to have been killed and buried in a flash flood, and is dated to the Blue Mesa member of the Chinle Formation, whereas Coelophysis is only known from the younger Petrified Forest member. However, Camposaurus was not only found in the Blue Mesa member, it was found within the Placerias quarry, so they were likely contemporaries. Whether they hunted adult Placerias, I still doubt, but juveniles would have certainly been a possibility for a small swift predator, I would think. The only issue I can see with the model is that the tusks should point more downwards rather than forwards, and may also have been encased in the skin in life. They are portrayed as using their tusks for digging up roots and tubers, and as amphibious and hippo-like, which is still thought to be the case. An excellent model still to this day. The next creature we meet is the Cynodont. Despite the show describing it as a missing link between reptiles and mammals, which by our modern understanding doesn't actually exist as I explained before, Cynodonts are the group of synapsids that gave rise to mammals. Whilst cynodont teeth were known from Chinle at the time, no genera were named, and so this creature was reconstructed based on the genus Thrinaxodon from early Triassic, South Africa and Antarctica. The genus Catygidodon was described from the Blue Mesa member of the Chinle formation in 2020, and is an accidental perfect fit for the cynodont scene in this episode. Even so, this creature is likely meant to be a vague representative of Triassic cynodonts in general, but judging it as a 30 million years out of time through an axodon, it's really good. The puppet even has whiskers, which can be inferred from small pits on an axodon's skull, which is superb. They are shown to live in and nurture their young in burrows. Fossils of Thrinaxodon have been found within burrows, thought to have been dug out by the creatures and used for shelter and even to estivate during dry seasons. They lay eggs like reptiles, which was likely the case as modern monotreme mammals, the echidnas and platypus, also lay eggs, and it's likely that they've retained this ancestral trait whilst other mammals evolved live birth. They're also said to have milk glands on their stomachs like mammals, Whilst monotremes do have milk glands, they lack teats, and so it seems likely that this trait evolved after the two other lineages of mammals, the marsupials and placentals, branched off from monotremes. Both of these traits indicate that monotremes are the most basal group of mammals alive today, and so they may provide the best insight for reconstructing their cynodont ancestors. Also, it's taken me like 25 years to notice, but is it eating a horseshoe crab? None are known from Chinle, so I'm gonna guess this was a reused prop from the third episode, Cruel Sea, as they appear in that episode and both it and New Blood were filmed in New Caledonia, so maybe the film crew just had that prop to hand. We're then introduced to Postosuchus. Its name means crocodile from post, 
referring to the post quarry in the Cooper Canyon formation in Texas, where its remains were first found. As its name suggests, whilst it was not a true crocodilian, it was an archosaur more closely related to crocodiles than to dinosaurs in the group Pseudosuchia. Its appearance here has a fair few problems, some of which were debated even at the time. Whilst the head is a fantastic recreation of the skull, it too is shrink-wrapped. Perhaps the biggest issue is that it is portrayed as a quadruped, capable of rearing up on its hind legs. Whether Postosuchus was a quadruped or biped was debated even at the time the show was produced, and they decided on the quadrupedal reconstruction. Several studies since the show aired have supported the bipedal model, noting how small both its forelimbs and hands were compared to its hind limbs, with the most recent consensus being that it was likely a biped that could become a facultative quadruped when moving at slow speeds. Speaking of the forelimbs, most likely as a consequence of them making it a quadruped, they seem too long and the hands have too many claws. No known archosaurs have more than three claws on their hands, so the Postosuchus having five seems unreasonable. The narration calls it the largest carnivore on earth, which I assume is meant to mean on land, as no doubt the largest carnivores, and in fact largest animals period on earth, were some of the enormous marine ichthyosaurs of the time. I only learned of this recently, but Postosuchus is not confidently known from the Chinle Formation. The type specimen was named in 1985 and is known from the Cooper Canyon Formation, and some highly complete skeletons of Rawisuchids, the family of Pseudosuchians Postosuchus belongs to, were found in the Chinle Formation and referred to Postosuchus in a paper in 1995. But the paper didn't justify their referral to the genus, and later studies questioned whether they really represent Postosuchus or another genus entirely. This was supported by the naming and description of the genus Viveron in 2016, a Rawisukid from Chinle distinct from Postosuchus, and the paper describing it stresses that much of the material referred to Postosuchus likely requires a more thorough re-evaluation. As such, the creature seen in this episode may turn out not to be Postosuchus at all. The greatest controversy with this animal concerns the infamous peeing scene, where a male Postosuchus marks its territory with urine. No modern archosaurs do this, and so if they're anything to go by, Postosuchus likely didn't either. Archosaurs also very rarely excrete liquid urine, but rather uric acid mixed with their feces as a solid mass. This is a more energetically costly process on a cellular level, but results in better water retention, and aids in flying birds especially, as it weighs less than liquid urine, making it easier to fly. This is interesting as the narration states that one of the reasons dinosaurs are so successful in the arid Triassic is because they waste very little water when they excrete. I'm not sure if this is intended to imply that reptiles like Postosuchus were inferior to dinosaurs in some way, even though they likely also didn't excrete urine, but maybe I'm looking too much into it. New Blood does cleverly portray the vague narrative of the entire Triassic period by showing the more ancient Dicynodonts and Pseudosuchians as the dominant land animals at the beginning of the episode, but become rarer by the end as the Postosuchus dies and is eaten by a flock of Coelophysis, and the Placerias are forced to migrate in search of water. Meanwhile, dinosaurs and pterosaurs would go on to dominate in the following Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. I feel I should stress that this wasn't because dinosaurs were inherently better, but rather that they just happened to have adaptations that were favourable for when conditions drastically changed at the end of the Triassic, that their competitors were not able to adapt to. This was not because they were inferior to dinosaurs, but rather because they were so well adapted to their ecosystems that when they very suddenly changed, they couldn't adapt in time and died out. This allowed dinosaurs to occupy the niches left vacant by their extinction. The next creature introduced is Patinosaurus. It was one of the first pterosaurs, the first group of vertebrates capable of true, powered, flapping flight, and fittingly, its name means wing lizard. 
Unfortunately, it's unlikely Potinosaurus would have ever encountered the North American creatures like Placerias and Postosuchus 220 billion years ago, as it is only known from the Zorzino limestone of Italy dated from 218 to 215 million years ago. To the show's credit, the narration describes it as an exotic hunter, suggesting that it is not native to the area, but even so, that is a huge distance to travel. But I suppose some birds migrate massive distances, so I don't see why pterosaurs couldn't do the same, so I'll let that slide. As for the model itself, it's honestly still quite good, with the issues being with pterosaur reconstructions generally, rather than Patinosaurus specifically. The most glaring outdated aspect is how the wings fold when they are grounded. They are shown folding in from the sides by bending the tips of the wings supported by their elongated fourth finger in and over their backs. More modern reconstructions have pterosaurs rotate their wrists either to the sides or backwards, causing the wings to fold over their backs. This is based on pterosaur trackways that show their front limbs pointed backwards when they walked. Their non-wing fingers are shown to point downwards in flight, but they are now thought to curve inwards towards the head whilst in flight. With their palms facing forwards, the wing tips also look very pointed, when they may have been slightly rounder, though this is debated. Otherwise though, the other two wing membranes, the one in front of the arms and the one connecting the legs to the base of the tail, all look to be correct. It has been correctly restored with pycnofibers, small skin filaments very reminiscent of simple feathers as seen in dinosaurs, and may even be feathers, but this is still being researched. Whilst it's great the head puppet has them, it should have more covering the entire body. The head might be slightly too small proportionally, but it's such a minor detail. It's portrayed as an insectivore, which is inferred from its sharp pointed teeth, which also doubles as showing how pterosaurs generally usurped insects as the aerial apex predators in the Mesozoic, which is wonderful. Considering how much our knowledge on pterosaurs has developed since 1999, I'd say the Patinosaurus is still pretty solid. The last creature in this episode appears very briefly at the end, and it is a second dinosaur, Platyosaurus. It was a member of the second of the three major dinosaur lineages, the sauropodomorphs, including the enormous long-necked sauropods and their more ancient relatives like Platyosaurus, which are sometimes referred to as prosauropods, but this term has fallen out of favour, as there are some basal sauropodomorphs that blur the line of what is and is not a sauropod. I have a video going into more detail on this subject too if you're interested in learning more. Again, there'll be a link in the description. Platyosaurus was much larger than Coelophysis, and its name fittingly means broad lizard, and was a herbivore, requiring a much broader stomach for digesting plants. Unfortunately, its portrayal here is quite outdated. For starters, it is shown to be a quadruped, but the majority of basal sauropodomorphs like Platyosaurus are now thought to have been exclusively bipedal. The head is shrink-wrapped and the wrong shape, as it appears quite triangular, whereas its skull was actually very long and rectangular in profile. Like Patinosaurus, Platyosaurus is only known from Europe, specifically the Lowenstein and Trossengem formations in Germany. To the producer's credit, Platyosaurus has a very complicated taxonomic history and was a wastebasket taxon for many Triassic sauropodomorphs, one of which was found in Greenland, part of continental North America, that in 2021 was referred to a new genus, Icy. Speaking of Greenland, the same paper I mentioned earlier that discussed how dinosaurs were well adapted to the cold conditions at the Triassic-Jurassic boundary also recognised that sauropodomorphs were generally only found in cooler regions closer to the poles before the Jurassic, so their presence in a hot and arid region like Chinle may be dubious. With that said, footprints attributed to bipedal sauropodomorphs were reported from the Chinle formation, so perhaps they did venture into hotter climates, or the footprints were not made by sauropodomorphs. With all these errors aside, 
the Platyosaurus herd does wonderfully exemplify the dawn of the age of dinosaurs to come in the following Jurassic period, with the dominance of enormous sauropods that will eventually evolve from creatures like them, perfectly leading into the next episode. There are two minor creature cameos in this episode. The first is that a Coelophysis is shown hunting a green lungfish. The lungfish genus Argonodus is known from the Chinle formation, so I'd assume that's what this creature is based on. The Patinosaurus are shown hunting dragonflies. I'm not sure what species are shown in the stock footage used in this episode, so if you know better than me, please do let me know in the comments. I do have some closing points I want to make. The narration states that dinosaurs first evolved 10 million years before, which was correct at the time and may still be today, as the oldest known dinosaur fossils are dated to roughly 230 million years ago. However, the obscure family Coelosauridae, long suspected to be close relatives of dinosaurs, have very recently been proposed to have been the earliest members of the third major lineage of dinosaurs, the Ornithischians. This neatly fills in a gap in the fossil record, as they were the only one of the three main groups of dinosaurs not confidently known from the Triassic, but now may represent the oldest known dinosaurs dating to the Middle Triassic. This remains controversial, but evidence is building in support of Coelosaurids as the oldest Ornithischians, and by extension, dinosaurs, pushing back their origins roughly 15 million years earlier than previously known. This episode is fantastic. I think it does a wonderful job of capturing the general trend of the Triassic period play out through the episode's runtime. Granted, there are some inconsistencies in terms of chronology and geography. Of the six creatures in this episode, only Placerias is definitively known from the time and place it's set. This does make me wonder, if the episode were to be remade today, is there a geological formation that has similar contemporaneous species to the creatures in this episode that could fill the roles they have in this episode's narrative? The answer is no. But we can get very close to this specific collection of species in a single formation. For this reimagining, I'd suggest the Los Colorados formation of Argentina, dated to 220 million years ago, as it has representatives for every creature except one. Coelophysis could be recast with the Coelophysoid Powell Venator. Placerias could be recast with the Dicynodont Jackaleria. The Cynodont could be the Carnivorous Tessalatia. Postosuchus could be recast with Fasolosuchus, which was thought to be quadrupedal, meaning it actually fits the Postosuchus in the episode better than Postosuchus itself. And Platyosaurus could be recast with Riochosaurus. The only one without a rep is Patinosaurus, as no pterosaurs are known from Los Colorados. However, two pterosaur genera are known from the neighbouring Quebrada del Barro formation, Pachagnathus and Yelefonti. They're of roughly the same geological age, so I think it's very plausible they could have been contemporaries of the other creatures. With the end of that thought experiment, I think it's high time we move on to the next episode. Episode 2, Time of the Titans, first aired on the 11th of October 1999. It is set 152 million years ago in the late Jurassic period in Colorado, and based on fossil finds from the Morrison Formation. Set a whopping 68 million years after New Blood, it is the largest time gap between episodes. Whilst it is a bit disappointing most of the Jurassic is skipped over, I can understand why the producers would want to jump ahead to the end of the period, as it is well represented in the fossil record and is when many of the most famous dinosaurs lived. The Morrison is most famous for its incredible diversity of sauropod dinosaurs, the largest animals ever to walk the earth, which unsurprisingly are the main focus of Time of the Titans. This episode has the broadest range of filming locations, at least in terms of countries, as a total of four were used, when the others had only one or two. This is because this episode has a diverse array of environments. The scenes in the conifer forest were filmed in Prairie Creek's Redwood State Park in California, with one scene specifically being filmed in Fern Canyon. There were apparently also additional shots in the forest filmed in the Wiranaki Forest in New Zealand. 
The scenes on the open firm prairies were filmed in Chile, possibly in Conguillo National Park or somewhere similar, and the scrublands were filmed in the labyrinth region of Tasmania. I'm sure the intention was to show how, generally, the Jurassic was a much more humid and lush world than the Triassic, thanks to the breakup of Pangaea into two smaller land masses, Laurasia in the north and Gondwana in the south. There is a bit of an issue here in that the sediments of the Morrison Formation generally preserve a more arid, savanna-like ecosystem than the more lush and humid ones shown here. This was corrected in the Ballad of Big Al. Granted, the Morrison has an enormous range across the western US, from north to south, and may have had a range of environments and climates at different latitudes. It is actually speculated that the northern range of the Morrison was more humid and tropical than in the south, due to the influence of the Sundance Sea, a shallow inland sea that was part of the Arctic Ocean, that extended through Canada and into the western US. It retreated due to the collision of the Pacific Tectonic Plate subducting under the North American Plate, uplifting highlands and draining the sea. Smaller sauropod species, such as Suawasea, are found only in the northern reaches of the Morrison in places like Montana, suggesting there may have been some sort of advantage to being smaller closer to the sea. Of course though, the main focus for the episode are the, well, titans of the Jurassic the giant sauropods found further south. The main creature for this episode is the sauropod Diplodocus. Its name means double beam, after the chevron bones on the underside of its tail. The model is sadly quite outdated now, mainly from our understanding of sauropods in general changing rather than Diplodocus specifically. The narration states that Diplodocus is the longest sauropod and could reach lengths of 40 meters. This was based on incorrect reconstructions of Diplodocus holorum, formerly its own genus, Seismosaurus, in 1994 that later studies showed had misplaced certain tail vertebrae, and with some perhaps not even belonging to Diplodocus, that muddled the length estimates. Most estimates now place Diplodocus carnegii, the best known species and likely what this animal is meant to be, at around 25 meters long. Still a huge creature, just not the behemoth it was once postulated as. It's also said to weigh 25 tons, however due to sauropod bones being filled with air sacs, they're now estimated to be much lighter, with modern estimates for D. carnegii being closer to 15 tons. It's tough to see their feet in much detail in most shots, but their front feet should be crescent-shaped and only have a thumb claw. Their hind feet should be roughly ovoid with five toes, with the innermost three toes having claws that curl outwards. As for the head, it is shrink-wrapped and the nostrils are placed on top of the head. This was thought to be correct at the time, as the nares, the skull holes for the nostrils, are placed on top of the head in most sauropods, and was thought to be an adaptation for breathing whilst eating. This was later disproven in the 2000s, when evidence of blood vessels on the front of the skull were identified, indicative of supplying blood to the fleshy nostrils. They are portrayed with a row of spines down their back's midline, Whilst not known from Diplodocus specifically, skin impressions of indeterminate Diplodoc kids have shown that at least some species had these spines along their backs, so I'd say it's reasonable to reconstruct Diplodocus with them. Their tails are correctly shown with whip-like tips. Whether these were actually used like whips is heavily debated, as this may have caused significant harm to the animal, so I won't critique this aspect. I do like the banded stripes on them though. Their chests also seem shrink-wrapped, with the outlines of their ribs visible from the outside, which would have only been the case for starving animals. The neck is also shrink-wrapped and is held very low to the ground. This was based on computer programs recreating the flexibility of Diplodocus's neck based on the articulations of its neck vertebrae. They showed that Diplodocus held its neck horizontally and struggled to lift its head higher than its shoulders. This is not supported by most scientists now, as many have pointed out that not only do almost all land vertebrates hold their necks in an extremely flexed position habitually, 
Neck bone articulation rarely represents how flexible an animal's neck is, and when accounting for muscles, tendons, and soft tissues, a higher degree of flexibility and habitual rest position was found for Diplodocus. As such, unless sauropods like Diplodocus are an extremely rare exception, most evidence points to them holding their heads and necks higher than is seen here. Speaking of posture, their shoulders are also now thought to be higher than their hips, as the sacral vertebrae of most sauropods, that is, the vertebrae over the hips, were wedge-shaped that pointed the front of the animal upwards, thought to be an adaptation to high browsing. With that said, Diplodocus and its closest relatives were thought to have been mid to low browsers, as they are portrayed as here. Strangely, a complete adult skull has never been confidently referred to Diplodocus, but other Diplodocid skulls are known, such as that of fellow Morrison sauropod Apatosaurus, which appears in Big Al, and we can make inferences about Diplodocus's skull from them. Their teeth were very long, thin, and positioned at the front of the mouth. Wear patterns on their teeth indicate that they would have stripped the leaves from their stems, such as from low-growing ferns and horsetails. The behind the scenes has a really insightful segment of the puppeteers of the juvenile Diplodocus head puppet, where the only method of feeding that looked plausible was the stem stripping method. A happy accident, perhaps. The narration also states that sauropods have a profound impact on their environment by felling trees as they search for low-growing plants to feed on. Which seems plausible enough to me, as elephants, for example, can be quite destructive feeders in a similar manner. The adult female seen at the beginning of the episode is shown laying her eggs with an egg tube to reduce the dangerous drop to the ground, similar to modern turtles. There is no evidence for such a structure in sauropods, and squatting is now considered a more plausible method of egg laying for these animals, but I still think it's a reasonable guess. Interestingly, no sauropod eggs are known from the Morrison, which may suggest they didn't nest in the region, perhaps because the region was extremely arid and lacking in food during the dry season. This might suggest the sauropods were migratory and nested elsewhere, or perhaps they did nest in the Morrison region, we just haven't found any evidence yet. Speaking of young sauropods, which are referred to as sauropodlets, in 2010, a juvenile diplodocid skull was referred to diplodocus, and it differed from adult diplodocid skulls in that its teeth were not entirely positioned at the front of the mouth, suggesting they may have fed differently to adults, or on different plants entirely. They are portrayed as R strategists, that is, they had many highly developed young and provided little to no parental care, with the intent that not all will survive due to predation. This is thought to be the case for sauropods, as nests have been found with many eggs, and also from inferences from the immense size of many sauropods, making it impractical to provide much care for their tiny young. The next creature we're introduced to is the theropod Ornitholestes. Its name means bird robber, after its very bird-like skeleton, and the narration rightly states that it is close to the ancestry of birds. Ornithalestes occupies a very unique position on the theropod family tree. It was a celurosaur, the group that includes birds and all animals more closely related to them than other theropods. It is placed just outside of the clade Maniraptora forms, which includes many groups such as dromaeosaurs, troodontids, and of course, birds. It is the general consensus that celurosaurs, at some point in their lifespan, had feathers, whether it be only as chicks for insulation that they gradually lost with age, or maintaining full plumage to adulthood. As such, Ornithalestes is suspected to have had feathers too. Whilst it doesn't have a full coat here, it does have small, quill-like feathers on the back of its head, but by modern standards, it would have likely have been fully coated, with non-flying wings on its arms, and likely a tail fan too. It is restored with typical theropod feet, three weight-bearing toes, and the hallux held off the ground. In 1969, John Ostrom, the paleontologist who discovered Deinonychus, noted that Ornitholestes' second toe claw was much larger than the third and fourth, and may have been held off the ground like that of Deinonychus, but noted that this was difficult to prove due to the poor preservation of the second toe. 
As such, Ornithalestes may have had the sickle claw, signature of dromaeosaurs and other bird-like theropods, rather than the more typical theropod foot, but this remains speculative. The somewhat iconic nasal horn of Ornithalestes, as seen here, was actually the result of a misinterpretation. The holotype skull snout appeared to flare upwards at the tip, which was initially interpreted as a small crest. It wasn't until after the show aired in the 2000s that this was reinterpreted as the skull tip being crushed after the animal died, meaning the animal most likely had a more typical small theropod skull. The head is also a bit too big proportionally, and the tip of the jaw should curve downwards slightly at the tip. So whilst it is of course outdated now, I think this Ornithalestes is an admirable restoration of a bird-like theropod for the late 90s. We then have this episode's pterosaur, Anurichnathus, meaning frog jaw. This model has a very long head, which was thought to be correct at the time, as the only specimen was crushed and was reconstructed with a large antorbital fenestra, the skull hole in front of the eye orbit. A second specimen found after the show aired was better preserved and showed that what was initially interpreted as the antorbital fenestra were actually the orbits, meaning Anurignathus likely had huge eyes in life. The neck is also much longer than the real animal skeleton. All of this is on top of the general outdated pterosaur issues, such as incorrectly folding wings and minimal pycna fibers. The latter is especially erroneous for Ignathus, as the second specimen showed small bumps on the tip of the snout. Interpreted as supporting pycnofiber whiskers, it is at least correctly portrayed with a short tail. One of the only species of the more basal ramphorhynchoid pterosaurs to have one, as they typically have long ones. Whilst it is correctly portrayed as an insectivore, as is indicated by its small pointed teeth, the way in which it hunts is purely speculative. Anurignathus is shown to live symbiotically with the Diplodocus, feeding on insects that swarm around them and likely gaining protection from their giant hosts, similar to modern ox peckers. There are two issues with this. Analyses of the sclerotic rings of Anurignathus, the bone rings in the eyes, indicate it was likely crepuscular, active during twilight suggesting an ecology more akin to modern night jars than ox peckers. The second issue is that Anurignathus is only known from Germany, and so was likely not a contemporary of Diplodocus, and perhaps any sauropods. As Germany was an island in the Tethys Sea at the time, and no sauropods being found at the site where it was found. The evidence book explains that it was moved to North America as Anurignathus had been found in Asia, suggesting they had a broad distribution. Pterosaurs can also fly, so it's at least feasible Anurignathus could have flown to North America. An alternative explanation is that these are not Anurignathus, but Mesodactylus, a pterosaur genus native to the Morrison that many pterosaur bones have been incorrectly referred to. The only fossil material referred to it confidently is a syn sacrum, an elongated bone over the hips that is most similar to Anurignathids. This wasn't resolved until after the show aired, so possibly by complete accident, again, these creatures could feasibly be real. Though I must stress, Mesodactylus is a very poorly understood genus, so take all of that with a pinch of salt. The next creature is Stegosaurus. This is the first Ornithischian dinosaur we are introduced to in the series. Its name means roof lizard, as its famous plates reminded its discoverer, Ophniel Charles Marsh, of roof tiles. Speaking of the plates, I guess I should start with those since they're its most famous feature. For starters, it has 17 plates, which is correct, as all known specimens of Stegosaurus stenops have between 17 and 22 plates. They look to be arranged in roughly the correct way, with them roughly alternating from one side to another along the back's midline. They are way too big though, bigger than those of any known Stegosaurus specimen. Whilst the scene where it pumps blood into its plates to turn them red is awesome and iconic, it is sadly no longer accurate. In 2012, analysis of the related Stegosaur, Hesperosaurus, showed that its plates were covered in keratin, which cannot change colour. The plates may have still been brightly coloured though, be it for sexual display or for intimidation. 
Another landmark discovery for Stegosaurus involves the specimen known as Sophie, an extremely complete subadult that helped clarify Stegosaurus's proportions when it was thoroughly examined in 2015. Sophie showed that we had been reconstructing Stegosaurus with too short of a neck and tail and too long of a torso. While Stegosaurus is still thought to have had longer hind limbs than its forelimbs, it was not as extreme as seen here, meaning its back was not as arched. Whilst the back feet look correct with three toes or with claws, the front feet only have four digits and three claws, when they should have five digits and only the innermost two should have claws. Even though the tail they're on the end of is now too short, the iconic Thagomizer arrangement of four spikes on the end of the tail look to be perfect. And we have direct evidence of them being used for defense in the form of an Allosaurus hip bone with a puncture, perfectly fitting a Stegosaurus tail spike. I was impressed to see the model does have the throat armor Stegosaurus is known to have, as well as the Ornithischian beak, which is excellent. The last note is on the cheeks. Cheeks on Ornithischians is a hotly debated topic, and from what I can tell, these cheeks seem to extend too far to the front of the mouth by modern standards, or it should lack cheeks entirely and instead have lizard-like lips. Now, the next creature, the theropod Allosaurus, meaning different lizard, I kind of already went over pretty thoroughly in my Ballad of Big Al review, so I'll keep this one brief. The Allosaurus seen in Time of the Titans likely represent the type species, A. fragilis, whereas Big Al has since been referred to the species named in 2020, A. gematsenai. Judging this model as A. fragilis, the crest should be slightly in front of the eyes rather than directly above them, and extend a bit further down the snout. The head is also too round in profile when it should be longer and more rectangular. It likely also had lips, the first theropod we've seen so far that's lacking them, which is another outdated aspect many theropod reconstructions had at the time, not to mention it also has pronated wrists. The last creature to appear is the sauropod Brachiosaurus. Its name means arm lizard after its especially long front limbs, thought to be an adaptation to high browsing, even more so than most sauropods. The evidence book states that this model is based on the highly complete Tanzanian specimen from the Tendaguru formation, dated to the same time as the Morrison, which at the time was referred to as Brachiosaurus branchi, but has since been reclassified as its own genus, Giraffa Titan. I think it makes the most sense to critique this model as an out-of-place Giraffa Titan, since that's the specimen it was modelled after. Starting with the head, it is quite badly shrink-wrapped, especially the ridge on top of the head. The narration states they weigh 70 tons and are the largest land animals that have ever existed, both of which no longer hold up, as more recent estimates place Giraffa Titan's mass anywhere from 25 to 50 tons. Several other sauropod genera are estimated to have been larger than Giraffa Titan and Brachiosaurus, such as Argentinosaurus, which later appears in Chased by Dinosaurs. The model shares the same outdated sauropod issues that Diplodocus has, like the nostrils on top of the head and the feet being wrong, but otherwise, it's a solid reconstruction of Giraffa Titan for the time, probably owing to its high level of completion. By comparison, the true Brachiosaurus, the North American B. altithorax is actually quite poorly understood, hence why the African specimen was used to reconstruct the animal. Granted, both animals are still extremely similar, as they are both in the family Brachiosauridae, but there are some key differences. Based on the scrappy material we do have of Brachiosaurus, compared to Giraffa Titan, it was more heavily built and seems to have had a slightly longer tail. The snout may have been longer, but the ridge on the top may have been shorter, based on a fairly complete skull referred to be altithorax, but as the holotype lacks a skull, it's impossible to say whether this skull is actually referable to Brachiosaurus. There are some minor creature cameos in this episode I'd like to go over. Throughout the episode, you get glimpses of small, bipedal dinosaurs that never get named. My best guess is that these are meant to be Dryosaurus, their name means tree lizard, and they were a type of herbivorous ornithopod. Their models are essentially identical to that of the Lealinosaura from episode 5, another small ornithopod. 
just with a dark green body and a red head. Dryasaurus would reappear in Big Al, still reusing the model, albeit with a different colour scheme. There's really not much to say, as they only appear as background animals in this episode, which is a shame. At least they're actually referred to by name in Big Al. We see insects attracted by the feeding of adult Diplodocus, which are fed on by damselflies. Interestingly, whilst not known at the time, the oldest known damselfly fossil was described in 2019 from the late Jurassic of Germany, called Jura hemiflebia. So damselflies were indeed around during the Jurassic. Whether they lived in North America specifically is unknown, but it seems highly plausible. Dung beetles are also seen rolling Diplodocus dung balls. The narration states that they originated in the Jurassic, and this is true of the scarab beetles as a whole, as their oldest fossils come from the middle Jurassic of Asia. Whether these were actual dung beetles that had evolved the coprophagus or dung rolling behavior seen here is unknown, but far from impossible. As for some closing thoughts on this episode, the quote, life on earth will never again be this large, is not really true if referring to Jurassic sauropods, as most of the candidates for largest land animal are Cretaceous sauropods. Unless this line is referring to sauropods generally, in which case it is still true. The last note I have is on the closing narration during the credits, which states that as the Jurassic ended, the sauropods went into decline due to rising sea levels, flooding their preferred lowland prairies and being replaced by Ornithischians. As such, we don't see any sauropods in the remainder of the series. This was a dubious statement even at the time, as sauropods continued to flourish until the end of the Cretaceous. The aforementioned appearance of Argentinosaurus in Chased by Dinosaurs even somewhat contradicts this. To their credit, the tie-in book does at least clarify that sauropods continue to flourish in the Cretaceous in South America. It's likely that the narration is referring to North America, as it specifically had a roughly 75 million year long sauropod hiatus in its fossil record from the end of the Jurassic 145 million years ago until the appearance of Alamosaurus at the very end of the Cretaceous around 70 million years ago. The evidence book even acknowledges this, stating that North America's late Cretaceous fauna was an exception in this regard, rather than the norm. Whilst this gap does still exist, it has shrunk considerably thanks to discoveries of early Cretaceous sauropods in North America, reducing the gap to around 30 million years. Whether sauropods were actually absent in North America during this time, or we simply haven't found evidence of them yet, is unknown. The main argument for the former being the encroaching western interior seaway in the Cretaceous, flooding much of their preferred habitat. This is all still speculative though. This episode is wonderful. Still not my personal favourite, as I feel that Diplodocus get a bit too much screen time compared to the other wonderful Morrison fauna, but the cinematography and music wonderfully capture the majesty of late Jurassic North America. Episode 3, Cruel Sea, first aired on the 18th of October 1999. It is set 149 million years ago in the late Jurassic period in Oxfordshire, England, which at the time was closer to the equator with a tropical climate and mostly submerged under the ancient Tethys Sea between Laurasia and Gondwana. This episode had above water shots filmed in the Isle of Pines region of New Caledonia, with the underwater shots and probably some of the coastal scenes filmed in the Bahamas. My original assessment of Cruel Sea back in 2020 remains basically unchanged. However, there is one major thing I just kind of glossed over. I said originally that the whole cast needed a recast to make sense chronologically, but then didn't elaborate further, and I don't know why. The animals featured in this episode hail from the Oxford clay in England, which dates to roughly 165 to 157 million years ago, before Time of the Titans. However, the younger Kimridge clay dates to pretty much exactly the episode setting of 149 million years ago. There are essentially two ways to fix the chronology issue. The first is to simply have Cruel Sea be the second episode and change its date accordingly. 
I understand why they didn't do this, however, as from a narrative standpoint, it makes much more sense for Time of the Titans to come second as it neatly follows on from the ending of New Blood by showcasing how dinosaurs had come to grow and dominate the planet in the Jurassic, rather than having a detour, if you will, from dinosaurs for marine reptiles. The other way is to recast the creatures in this episode from the appropriately aged Kimrich Clay. This second approach fits the narrative better in my eyes, as the episode's plot still works and is more paleontologically accurate. As such, the creatures could be recast with the following genera for a more accurate recreation of the time and place showcased. The plesiosaur Cryptoclidus, which means hidden clavicles, should be replaced with one of its two fellow cryptoclided plesiosaur relatives, either Chimerosaurus or the more completely known Columbosaurus. Whilst the concept of plesiosaurs like Cryptoclidus moving on land is now generally dismissed, the evidence book makes a very interesting point contradicting the episode. It states that Cryptoclidus weighed less than elephant seals, which can move on land. The heaviest recorded elephant seals can weigh up to 4 tons, yet the narration states Cryptoclidus weighs 8 tons. Most mass estimates put Cryptoclidus as weighing closer to 1 ton, but usually less. The tie-in book also states they're about 7 meters long, but most estimates put Cryptoclidus at 4 meters long. The most efficient method of swimming for plesiosaurs is still debated, so I won't critique the alternating front and back stroke the animators went for here. In my original review, I seem to have just forgotten to mention that plesiosaurs are now thought to have had small tail flukes. I also said that the Cryptoclidus swallowing stones for ballast may not be accurate. I think I was referring to the theory that their main purpose was for grinding up food in the stomach, but there's no reason they couldn't also provide ballast too. The next creature, the Ichthyosaur Ophthalmosaurus, which means eye lizard, may actually be present in the Kimridge clay. However, this isn't certain, so perhaps its close relative, Nanotarygius, would be a more fitting replacement. Their portrayal has aged pretty wonderfully, in all aspects really. Weirdly though, the narration states that adult Ophthalmosaurus lack teeth, even though both the CG model and puppet have teeth. Weird. Next is this episode's pterosaur, Rampharynchus, meaning beak snout. It is actually known from the Kimmeridge clay, so it's the only creature that wouldn't need to be recast. The model's head has these really weird, pointed, keratinized tips. The snout of Rampharynchus was very pointed, but was more likely to have been made of softer tissues. I'm guessing this was due to the idea of them living similarly to black skimmers, which have extremely pointed beaks. Analysis of its sclerotic rings have also concluded Rampharynchus was most likely nocturnal. Presumed to be a result of niche partitioning with other diurnal pterosaurs it lived alongside to avoid competition. So we probably shouldn't see them so active during daylight like in this episode, but this wasn't known at the time. The neck looks to be too long, and the veins on the tip of the tail should probably be more asymmetrical, with the top one being taller than the bottom one. Up next is Hybodus, meaning crooked tooth. It was a wastebasket taxon at the time for many cartilaginous fish from the entire Mesozoic era. So whether this animal is actually Hybodus is basically impossible to tell. I talked about this in my review of sea monsters, so if you're interested in learning more about that, there'll be a link to that video in the description. A close relative is known from the Kimridge clay, Asteracanthus, and actually looked very similar to Hybodus and seems like the most fitting recast. Up next we have the most famous, or infamous, creature of this episode, the Pliosaurid Lyplurodon, which means smooth side teeth. It could be replaced with Pliosaurus, as it was actually closer to the enormous size of the animal seen in the episode, albeit still substantially smaller than the almost blue whale-sized behemoth seen here. Like the Cryptoclidus, it too should now have a tail fluke, and its teeth are now thought to have been straighter, rather than the very tusk-like appearance this model has. Other than it being massively oversized, 
it's still a solid model anatomically for the time. The only dinosaur of the episode is the theropod you strep to spondylus, meaning true well-curved vertebrae. I only talked about its inaccuracies very briefly in my original review, and I don't know why. Eustreptospondylus is only known from a single, incomplete subadult specimen, and thus may not reflect the anatomy of an adult. What we do know is that it was a member of the Megalosaurids, which in recent years have had a bit of a makeover. Their snouts were much longer than this model portrays, and they generally had longer torsos than this model has, though this is likely due to it being a slightly modified version of the Allosaurus model. It also has the typical wrist pronation. Its portrayal as a nomadic island dweller is also completely speculative, but seems plausible to me. Eustreptospondylus is perhaps the most interesting creature to recast, as there are several potential candidates. Considering it as a megalosaur, a fitting recast could be its larger relative, Torvosaurus, which is represented in the Kimrich clay, but only by a tibia and a skull fragment. Another possible candidate is the more definitively known genus from the Kimmeridge clay, Jura Tyrant. Its name means Jurassic Tyrant, and as its name suggests, was a member of the Tyrannosauroids related to Tyrannosaurus. It's unfortunate that this animal wasn't described or named until after the show came out, as if it had been featured in this episode, it would have been quite a fitting way to foreshadow the appearance of its later relative, Tyrannosaurus, in episode 6. It is only known from a single, incompletely known specimen, but when the missing elements are reconstructed based on its more complete relative, Stokesosaurus, from the Morrison Formation, its length is estimated to be about 5 to 6 metres, which is a near-perfect match to the Eustreptospondylus' size in the episode. Now for the minor creature appearances, and this episode has a lot. There are countless species of sponges, corals, fish, and other reef creatures that I couldn't possibly begin to ID without taking roughly a century, so I'll just skip over them. The Ammonites are not referred to by a specific genus in the episode, but in the tie-in book are ID'd as Perisphinctes, and they fit the bill of homomorph late Jurassic Ammonite and are actually used as index fossils for the time period. There's some stock footage of modern moon jellyfish, the school of live-action sardines we see the Cryptoclidus and Ramphorhynchus hunt are most likely meant to represent the similar, though unrelated genus, Leptolepis. We do very briefly see a type of sea turtle in this episode. All we see of it though is a rotten carapace being scavenged by Eustreptospondylus, so it's basically impossible to ID it with certainty. Modern sea turtles didn't evolve until the Cretaceous. However, the now extinct Thalassochelidians were a separate group of turtles from the Jurassic that independently became adapted to marine habitats via convergent evolution. Several genera belonging to this group are known from the Kimmeridge clay, so if we want to label it with a genus name, let's go with Thalassemis. We also very briefly see bark beetles, but the oldest known fossils are dated to the early Cretaceous, but I guess it's not impossible they originated earlier. We also witness the Diel vertical migration, a natural phenomenon in large water bodies where aquatic microorganisms will rise to the surface waters at night. These are then fed on by large creatures like fish and squid, which in turn are fed on by the Ophthalmosaurus with their incredible sense of sight. Whilst called squid, these may actually be belemnites, an extinct group of cephalopods closely related to squid, but differed in that they retained an internal shell, which are common fossils, and had small hooks on their arms for snaring prey rather than suckers. We also see horseshoe crabs, which, whilst live acted by what I assume are modern Atlantic horseshoe crabs, the Jurassic genus Mesolimulus is known from amazingly preserved specimens from Middle Jurassic England and Late Jurassic Germany. So even with the cast overhaul, the overall story of the episode still works, as they all fit the roles just with different names essentially. Despite the crazy big Lyplurodon, I still adore this episode, and it's my personal favourite, and probably always will be. It's shot beautifully, and the music and sound design are both calming, yet also eerily unsettling. 
episode 4, Giant of the Skies, first aired on the 25th of October 1999. It is set 127 million years ago in the early Cretaceous period and portrays a globe-trotting story going from Brazil to the USA to England and ending in Spain. This episode was mostly filmed on the west coast of New Zealand's South Island. The sea cliffs of Brazil were filmed at the Pancake Rocks and Blowholes area in Paparoa National Park. The scenes in North America were filmed on the coast of Bruce Bay, and the scenes in Spain were filmed on the Hari Hari Coastal Walkway. The only scenes that weren't were those set in England, which were filmed in the Labyrinth region of Tasmania, the same place as the Scrublands from Time of the Titans. Whilst my original assessment of this episode hasn't really changed since 2020, there are quite a few things I feel warrant going into in more detail. Giant of the Skies is jam-packed with stuff to talk about, a lot of which I kind of just omitted from my original review. The segment in Brazil was based on fossil finds from both the Crato and slightly younger Romualdo formations, dated from 115 to 110 million years ago. So yeah, we have an immediate anachronism, as all the creatures seen here are geologically too young to appear when this episode is set. As to be expected of the pterosaur episode, this is the only episode with multiple pterosaur species. The main star of this episode is the pterosaur referred to as Ornithochirus, meaning bird hand. The Brazilian form from the Romualdo formation, Ornithochirus mesembrinus, has since been reclassified as its own genus, Tropeugnathus, meaning keel jaw. Ornithochirus is now only known from England from rocks dated to 105 to 100 million years ago and is known from very scrappy fossil material. There's also no evidence of Ornithochirus fossils being identified in Spain, from what I can tell. The closest I can find is some fragmentary remains from early Cretaceous Portugal referred to the genus in 1994, but I'm dubious this referral is correct, to be honest. It's still possible both Ornithochirus and Ornithochirus could have flown to Cantabria, as shown in the episode. There's just no evidence that can prove this theory. Tropeugnathus' size is exaggerated from the fossils, as the highest estimates give it an 8 meter wingspan, rather than the 12 meters seen here. It is portrayed as a skim feeder, dragging its crested snout through the water, similar to the Rampharhynchus, but it was likely too large to do this effectively, and is now thought to have simply flown over prey and snapped it clean out of the water. The scene where it is grounded due to rainwater waterlogging the pycnofibers on its wings, making it unable to fly, no longer holds up to scrutiny. Several pterosaurs, such as Pteranodon and Rampharhynchus, are thought to have been diving marine pterosaurs, similar to modern gannets, meaning wet wings would have been no detriment to pterosaurs' flight. Likewise, another pterosaur hindrance is highlighted in this episode, ground movement. They are portrayed as very ungainly on land with a very strained walk, exemplified by some funny behind the scenes clips of the crew trying to recreate it with broomsticks under their arms. However, more recent studies of their anatomy suggest they were quite competent at moving on the ground, with some speculated to be capable of running. This is also the first pterodactyloid pterosaur in the series. The older Rampharhynchoids, which includes all the long-tailed forms, appeared to become almost entirely extinct by the end of the Jurassic, with the exception being the Anurachnathids, as the genus Vesperoterylus is known from early Cretaceous China, though this wasn't described until 2017 and had a short tail. So, the assertion that long-tailed pterosaurs became extinct by the Cretaceous appears to still be true. The pterosaur referred to in the episode as Tapijara, meaning Lord of the Ways or Ancient Being, was discovered in the sediment of the Crato Formation. This animal, Tapijara navigans, has since been reclassified into another genus, Tupandactylus, meaning Tupan Finger, along with another species formerly referred to Tapijara, T. imperator. The crest has weird ridges on it, but I guess it's possible they were present in life? Their limb proportions are also slightly off, as their hind limbs should be longer and their forelimb should be slightly shorter. I'm guessing they copied and pasted the Ornithochirus' body model and changed the head. 
tapijarids are also now thought to have eaten fruit further inland. So it's a little weird that they've gathered on the coast just to mate, but this wasn't known at the time. The now only valid species of tapijara, T. welnhoferi, hails from the Romualdo formation. So not only did Tropiognathus and Tupendactylus not live at the same time at the episode setting 127 million years ago, they may not have even been contemporaries of each other. So this episode is already off to a weird start. Next up we have the dinosaur Iguanodon, meaning Iguana Tooth. There is a European species that actually represents Iguanodon bernisartensis, most likely living in the Wessex formation of the Isle of Wight. There is also the North American species, formerly Iguanodon lakotaensis, now referred to its own genus, Dakotodon, meaning Dakota Tooth, from the Lakota formation of South Dakota both dated to roughly 125 million years ago, so neither lived specifically 127 million years ago when the episode is set, but I don't think it's a huge issue. Iguanodon was a wastebasket taxon for many ornithopod species across the globe for much of the almost two centuries people have known about it. Recent re-evaluation has shown that Iguanodon is now only known from Europe. Regarding the European species, Iguanodon proper, it should now have non-pronated wrists, as it was only the more derived hadrosaurids that had pronated wrists. The arms should also be much bulkier. One of the ornithopods lumped into Iguanodon was the animal now known as Mantellisaurus, which had quite gracile forelimbs, so maybe this model is based on Mantellisaurus. It's impossible to say whether this has any bearing on the North American Dakotodon, as it is only known from a partial skull, so I can't really critique it. As with the Stegosaurus and other Ornithischians, by more modern standards, the cheek should not go so far to the front of the mouth, assuming it had cheeks at all, rather than lizard-like lips. The narration also states that Iguanodon was the first animal to be able to chew with its back teeth, but other Ornithischians had been chewing since the early Jurassic, such as the Heterodontosaurs, but Iguanodon is the first creature we've been introduced to to have grinding back teeth. Up next, we have the creature I think needs the most thorough revisit for this episode, Polacanthus, meaning many thorns, both the European and North American species. The identity of the North American animal is quite interesting. Polacanthus was an ankylosaur, a group of heavily armoured Ornithischians related to the Stegosaurs. The exact relationships of ankylosaurs are in flux at the moment, but generally ankylosaurs can be broadly divided into two groups, those with tail clubs and those without. Polacanthus is in the latter camp and is known only from fairly incomplete remains from the Wessex Formation of England. The evidence book states that due to the proximity of Europe and North America during the early Cretaceous, it's possible Polacanthus could live on both continents. The North American species seen here was originally referred to its own genus in 1922, Hoplitosaurus, meaning hoplite lizard, and was a contemporary of Dakotodon. At the time though, it was lumped into the genus Polacanthus as P. martii, and only after production ended was it confidently referred to as a distinct genus again. In my original review, I said that Hoplitosaurus was poorly understood due to being so fragmentary, but judging it based on the European Polacanthus foxii, it was quite good. I don't really know what I was talking about, as Polacanthus itself was also poorly understood. What I failed to realise is that Polacanthus itself is usually restored based on another closely related, more complete ankylosaur, Gastonia, named after its discoverer, Robert Gaston. Confusingly, the North American version of Walking with Dinosaurs refers to this North American species as Gastonia, which makes sense as it lived in Utah during the early Cretaceous. The front half of Polacanthus's skeleton is unknown. The evidence book even acknowledges that based on the skull of Gastonia, the head of the Polacanthus in the show is likely too long. It also seems to lack a beak, which all Onithischians had. 
What is known of Polacanthus is its back end, including its pelvic shield, a broad, flat lump of bone over its hips, which is reconstructed on this model, though it probably wasn't so visible in life. Most researchers have speculated that the large, keeled scutes formed horizontal rows down the torso and the tail, which are reconstructed. The rest of the armour on the front half of its body is completely speculative for Polacanthus, as is most of Hoplitosaurus, but if we treat the North American species as Gastonia, then we have more to analyse. Gastonia's armour, whilst not complete, is much better known than those of the other two. The neck armour of Gastonia differs from most ankylosaurs, as they typically have two half rings of armour with four segments each. However, Gastonias only have two segments each. This model has the more typical four segmented half rings, which would be inaccurate for Gastonia. A common speculation for Gastonia is that the large curved scutes found disarticulated with the skeleton form a pair between the shoulders close to the back's midline and formed part of several rows across the back. This model does have these, but they weirdly curve outwards, which I've never seen on an ankylosaur before. The tail ends with a weird lance head shape at the tip. I don't know if that's based on anything, as it's odd. It's hard to tell, but I'm pretty sure the model has four toes, which is correct for clubless ankylosaurs generally. It also appears to correctly have five fingers, though only the innermost three should have claws. So, uh, yeah, the quote-unquote Polacanthus slash Hoplitosaurus slash Gastonia warranted a lot more discussion than I gave it to my original review. Now we have everybody's favourite creature, the European Utah Raptor. To the surprise of probably nobody, its name means Utah Caesar. The evidence book suggests that due to there being relatives of both the European Iguanodon and Polacanthus known from North America, the same could be plausible for North American dromaeosaurs like Utah Raptor, hence why it was placed in England in the episode. It also points out that there was in fact a dromaeosaurid known from the Wessex formation, Ornithodesmus. Interestingly, in 2004, large dromaeosaur bones were found in the Wessex formation. It wasn't until 2021 that these remains were referred to the new genus, Vectiraptor. This represents a weirdly good fit for the Utah Raptor in this episode, albeit by complete coincidence, which is funny in hindsight. Ironically, they could have placed this scene in North America, and it would have been alongside its contemporary, Gastonia, from the Cedar Mountain Formation. Assuming the North American Ankylosaur is actually Gastonia, of course. Granted, Utah Raptor is only definitively known from the older Yellow Cat member, dated from 139 to 135 million years ago. But there is a single pelvic fragment that may belong to Utah Raptor, known from the younger Poison Strip member, which began deposition roughly around the exact time the episode is set. The model also doesn't really resemble Utah Raptor, as it was a very heavily built dromaeosaur with a very blunt snout. This appears to be based more on Deinonychus, as was typical of dromaeosaur reconstructions at the time. Needless to say, it should also now have a full coat of feathers too. The evidence book even acknowledges this. The wrists also pronate like many other theropods. Pack hunting in dromaeosaurs is also not that well supported either, but it's far from impossible they occasionally hunted somewhat cooperatively to bring down larger prey. The early bird seen in this episode, whilst not named in the show, supplementary material IDs it as Iberomazornis, meaning Iberian Intermediate Bird. It is known from the La Huagina Formation in Spain, dated to around the same time as the Wessex Formation. It is a tricky one to analyse, as its group, the Enantiornifs, aka opposite wing birds, due to their shoulder and arm articulation being the opposite of all modern birds, are extremely variable. Whilst this model is reconstructed with a tail fan made of several feathers, many opposite birds had only two long tail feathers. It's difficult to make out, but the model does appear to have a large claw on its first finger, which is accurate. 
The narration also implies that birds will eventually outcompete pterosaurs, which was a theory based on the fact that by the end of the Cretaceous, only a single family of pterosaurs seemed to remain, the giant Ashdarkids, having been competitively excluded from niches in forested environments by birds with their more durable feather wings than the membranous ones of pterosaurs. This theory has been overturned, as a diverse range of pterosaurs has since been discovered in the sediments of the Ouled Abdoum deposits in Morocco, dated to the end of the Cretaceous, showing that pterosaurs were in fact still diverse. As for the minor creatures in this episode, you very briefly see a wasp pollinating a flower. The oldest fossil wasps are dated to the early Jurassic, so they had been around for millions of years already by this time. Whether they or any of their relatives had evolved the pollinating lifestyle yet is unknown. The early Cretaceous giant stem flea, Saurothyrus, seen sucking the blood of the Tropiognathus, is only known from Asia, but I suppose they could have reached anywhere via their hosts, assuming they did in fact feed on pterosaur blood. Speaking of pterosaurs, there are a few unidentified generic pterosaurs seen throughout the episode in both North America and Europe, with a small backwards pointing head crest. This model may be the one that would later be used as the Ajdarko in Chased by Dinosaurs. Whilst never identified anywhere, the best fit seems to be Corchicephalus, an ornithochirid with a small head crest from the Wessex Formation. It was only named and described in 2005 though, so it couldn't possibly have been named in the show. Whilst not named in the show, this reused, untextured shot of the Lyplurodon is apparently meant to be Plesiopleurodon. Whilst at the time it was thought to be a pliosaurid, similar to Lyplurodon, hence its name meaning near side tooth, it is now thought to be a polycotylid, an unrelated family of plesiosaurs also with short necks and long heads from the Cretaceous. As such, Lyplurodon is probably not that representative of its anatomy, as they were generally more gracile and lightly built than pliosaurids like Lyplurodon. This is the most out of place creature in the episode, as Plesiopleurodon lived roughly 98 million years ago, almost 30 million years later than the episode's setting, and was found in Wyoming, meaning it lived in the Western Interior Seaway but I suppose it could have also lived in the Proto-Atlantic too. So, is there a way to redo this episode today and have it make more sense chronologically and geographically? Potentially. Trollman's redux on DeviantArt of this episode provides a more plausible migratory plot from Spain to England. I highly recommend you check out his page there. A link will be in the description. Regarding the North American species, if the location was the Cedar Mountain Formation in Utah, if the scenes of the episode were rearranged slightly, with the Utah Raptor hunt happening in North America instead of Europe, it could be feasible chronologically. My original assessment still stands, as this episode is a mess scientifically, but I still love it. The journey of the Ornithochirus, whilst entirely speculative, is such a cool spectacle and a great basis for an episode story, and once again, it is shot beautifully and the music is incredible. Episode 5, Spirits of the Ice Forest, first aired on the 1st of November 1999. It is set 106 million years ago in the early Cretaceous period. Despite the episode claiming to be set in Antarctica, it is based on fossil finds from Australia, which was connected to Antarctica during the Cretaceous as part of Gondwana, so it's feasible the animal seen here could have also lived in Antarctica. This episode was filmed in Wirinaki Forest in New Zealand. My original assessment is mostly still the same. The creatures in this episode are essentially a conglomeration of the faunas of early Cretaceous Australia. The Wonthaggi Formation, dated to roughly 125 million years ago, the slightly younger Eumarola Formation, dated from 118 to 110 million years ago, both in Victoria, the Tulabuk Formation of Queensland dated to roughly 105 to 100 million years ago, and maybe also the Gryman Creek Formation of New South Wales dated to 106 million years ago. As such, this episode is set in a very weird middle point between all of the ages of deposition for these formations. 
the opening narration of the episode states that by the middle of the Cretaceous, dinosaurs were more widespread than ever, which is a strange claim, as dinosaurs appear to have been present all over the globe as early as the late Triassic. I'm guessing this claim is to help explain to the audience how dinosaurs had reached the poles? I don't know. The main creature for this episode, Lialinosaura, meaning Lialin's lizard, hasn't really had any significant scientific updates since my original video. That is, except for the general Ornithischian cheek debate. It hails from the Umarola formation, so likely would have been extinct by the time of the episode's setting. The claim it would have needed feathers for the cold winter may not hold up, as more recent studies on dinosaur thermoregulation have suggested Ornithischians likely could tough out freezing temperatures by seeking shelter, or as Series 1 Connor Temple is so keen on, huddling together for warmth. So the portrayal of them huddling here has almost come back around to being accurate again in a sense. It is also possible they had some feather covering too, perhaps similar to that of the Morosaurus in Prehistoric Planet, which is fitting as they lived in similar climates and were closely related. The head might be too short and Hypsilophodon-like compared to the skull. There are specimens that have occasionally been referred to Lialinosaurus since 2009 with extremely long tails. But this is controversial, so I won't critique the tail length of this model, as it seems reasonable to me, both for the time and now. There's also no evidence they lived in clans or nested together, but it's not impossible they did so, though they do seem on the complex side for dinosaurs. The cool amphibian, Coolasuchus, meaning cool's crocodile, also hasn't really had any significant updates since 2020. It is only known from the Wonthaggy Formation, roughly 125 million years ago, so likely wasn't a contemporary of Lialinosaura. It's also not certain whether it was outcompeted by relatives of crocodiles, but it seems like a plausible explanation for its extinction, as the South Polar region experienced a warming period around 100 million years ago, which may have made the area more hospitable to cold-blooded crocodilians. I probably shouldn't be surprised that one of the creatures that still requires a lot of elaboration is the ever-enigmatic Polar Allosaur. This time at least it was actually my own fault in my lack of research. According to The Evidence Book, the Polar Allosaur was based on a single astragalus, the main ankle bone of a theropod found in the Wonthaggy Formation. It was originally referred to as Allosaurus robustus, due to its similarities to the astragalus of Allosaurus, thought to represent a relict population of allosaurs at the South Pole in the early Cretaceous. Since the show aired, this classification has been revised and reclassified to the theropod group Megaraptora. I was rightly called out by the comments in the original video for failing to realise that the group Megaraptora hadn't even been named until 2010, 11 years after the show aired, so of course they wouldn't have known much about them or how to reconstruct them if they hadn't even been recognised as a group yet. You f***ing idiot! Megaraptorans are documented from Australia, the best known being Australoveneta from the Winton Formation in Queensland dated from 195 million years ago, but was named later in 2009. Whilst it is unknown whether the Allosaurus robustus ankle bone found in the Wonthaggy Formation is referable to this genus, if the animal seen here does represent Australoveneta, then it is now known to have been a contemporary of at least Lialinosaura, as some fragmentary remains from the Umarola Formation were assigned to the genus in 2019. Whether these much older remains represent a different species from the type and currently only species, A. wintonensis, requires further study. As for the Allosaurus robustus astragalus, as of 2019, it is referred to as Megaraptora indeterminate and similar to that of Australoveneta. Generally, Megaraptorans had much more slender, pointed snouts than the rounder head seen here in profile. To be fair, this is because it's a repurposed Allosaurus model, which shares these issues to a degree. 
Megaraptorans are known for their powerful arms and huge hand claws, and so they were likely their primary method of prey capture, rather than their heads as shown here when it attacks the Lialinosaura, but this couldn't have been known at the time. Needless to say, the wrist shouldn't pronate either. Whether they were migratory, as the narration suggests, is also completely speculative, but far from impossible. The last of the only four major creatures of this episode is Mutaburrasaurus, meaning Mutabura lizard. It is only known from Queensland and New South Wales from 112 to 103 million years ago, but as is shown in the episode, may have migrated south for the summer into the polar forest to take advantage of the rich plant growth under the midnight sun and to lay their eggs. Whilst their distinct nasal bullers don't show explicit evidence of any inflatable structure, it's still possible such a thing was present in life. Alternatively, they may have been brightly coloured in life in the males for displaying for females. This is all speculative though. The only real update it's had, other than the Ornithischian cheat debate, is extremely recent. In June of 2024, a paper on basal Ornithischians placed it in Elasmaria, a group of ornithopods found only in Gondwana, along with Fostoria, a similar dinosaur also from Australia. As for minor creatures, this is the only episode that doesn't have a named species of pterosaur, so you do very briefly see some apparently migrating south for the summer. Pterosaurs have been known from Australia since the 1980s, but none had been named until after the show aired. A single pterosaur leg bone is known from the Eumarola formation, but little is known about it. The evidence book states that the lower jaw of a pterosaur was known from early Cretaceous Queensland that was similar to Ornithochirus. This jaw was given its own genus name in 2011, Aussie Draco. Whether these animals are meant to be Aussie Draco though is unknown, and you can barely see them in the episode, so I can't really critique them, but all known Australian pterosaurs looked fairly similar to Ornithochirus, with the large crest on the tips of the snout. Likewise, whether they were migratory is also impossible to tell. The unnamed mammal live acted by a Kawati Mundi is supposedly meant to be Storopodon, the possible platypus-like monotreme, maybe. It is known from the Grime and Creek formation of New South Wales, so may not have lived in the polar forests. The genus Cryorictes, named in 2005, a fellow potential platypus-like monotreme, was a contemporary of Lialinosaura. Whether it raided dinosaur nests though is unknown. In either case, a Kawati Mundi is not a good stand-in. There's also stock footage of Tuatara and Weta, with the narration stating that the Tuatara is more ancient than dinosaurs and will be around after they become extinct. Whilst the reptile group Rhynchocephalia, whose only living member is the Tuatara from New Zealand, first evolved during the early Triassic, the modern Tuatara evolved after the dinosaurs became extinct. Most likely, this line is referring to Rhynchocephalians as a whole though. New Zealand was still connected to Australia during the early Cretaceous, and so the ancestors of the Tuatara may have been present there at the time. Whether the ancestors of Weta were present, however, is completely unknown. So, I don't know how justified their inclusion is in this episode, as there is no fossil evidence for either from the time. There's some biting flies that suck the blood of Mutaburrasaurus. I assume this is stock footage of female mosquitoes, but what species? I'm not really sure. The oldest fossils of true flies date back to the Middle Triassic, and within this group, mosquitoes are members of the Calicomorpha, which are estimated to have originated during the early Jurassic. The mosquito family Culicidae, however, is only known confidently from amber dated to the late Cretaceous. Mosquitoes are far from the only blood-sucking flies though, as the horseflies, for example, forming the family Tabanidae, are known from the early Cretaceous and likely fed on reptiles like dinosaurs. Both groups are thought to have radiated alongside flowering plants, which were likely their main food source. The closing narration states that south polar dinosaurs will become extinct in the next few million years as the climate becomes colder. However, the climate actually became warmer. The Bonarelli event, a period of volcanic activity that raised the temperatures of the polar region, meant this region would remain fairly warm until the end of the Eocene epoch around 34 million years ago. This episode is a weird one. 
and I love it for that. As for how to recreate this episode to make it make sense chronologically and geographically with our current knowledge, this is a tricky one, as many of the creatures are stated to be migrants, so perhaps it doesn't matter that much that they're out of place. With that said, there's no way to maintain representatives of all the unique fauna into one formation without cutting one, sadly. Perhaps the best approach would be to set it 100 million years ago in the Grime Creek formation. Lealanosaura could be recast with the similar small ornithopod, Weewarasaurus, named in 2018. The Polar Allosaur could be recast and probably redesigned entirely to look like the Megaraptoran, Rapata. Granted, this genus, like basically all Megaraptorans, is poorly known, as it is only known from a single hand bone very similar to that of Australoveneta, so the best approach would probably be to reconstruct it mostly based on that genus. Mutaburosaurus could be recast with its close relative, Fostoria, named in 2019. Steropodon is native to Grimic Creek, but should likely be given its own CGI model to reflect its possible platypus-like appearance. Indeterminate pterosaur material is known from Grimic Creek too. That just leaves Coolasuchus, and considering it's famous for being the last Tamnospondyl amphibian, it's kind of impossible to recast it with a faithful, geologically younger representative. The best we can do is maybe replace it with the crocodile-like Isisfordia to fill its role in the story as a semi-aquatic ambush predator. New South Wales is slightly further north than Victoria, but still very close to the South Pole, and may have still experienced the polar nights and midnight sun phenomena albeit on a less extreme scale, so I'd say the story could still work if it were set in the Grime and Creek formation. I do still love this episode, and think it's the most interesting, and I applaud the producers for focusing on more obscure animals like these. Episode 6, Death of a Dynasty, is the final episode and first aired on the 8th of November 1999. It is set 65.5 million years ago in the late Cretaceous period in Montana, and immediately we have a very slight chronology issue, as the geological dating for the end of the Cretaceous has been pushed back ever so slightly to 66 million years ago, but this was found years after the show aired. This small change to the date doesn't alter the animals seen in this episode, as they were all based on fossil find from the Hell Creek Formation. Most of this episode was filmed in Conguillo National Park in Chile, except for the scene with the male T-Rex at the foot of the volcano, which was filmed at Orake Caraco in New Zealand's North Island. My original assessment of the episode's portrayal of the Hell Creek ecosystem being too desolate still stands, but it does fit the theme of the episode. Granted, Hell Creek likely did have some volcanoes due to the tectonic uplift of the Rocky Mountains at the time. I also stated that by the time of the episode's setting, the world was actually recovering from a volcanic episode, but didn't elaborate that said volcanic episode was the eruption of the Deccan Traps in India, a large igneous province which are estimated to have erupted 350,000 years before the Chishul of meteorites struck the Earth. It has been suggested that widespread volcanic ash from this event may have potentially lowered global dinosaur populations, making them more vulnerable to extinction by the time the meteor struck, but this remains speculation. Oh, and we also now know the meteorite struck the Earth during spring in the Northern Hemisphere, thanks to the detailed study of fish bones that died the day the meteor hit, as their bones contain isotopes that indicate they had annual life cycles of feeding on certain foods and reproducing at certain times of the year. We don't know what time of year it is in the episode, so I can't really comment on this any further. The first creature we see in this episode is the mammal Didelphodon, meaning double possum tooth. The only correction I have is that both I and the narration refer to it as a marsupial, when it was not a true marsupial, but rather a metatherian, the more inclusive group that includes all mammals more closely related to marsupials than other mammals. The evidence book also clarifies this. Otherwise though, my original assessment still stands, as it should look much more like an otter than a badger. The main creature for this episode, Tyrannosaurus rex, meaning Tyrant Lizard King, still looks rough. The head is way too blocky and shrink-wrapped. 
Whilst the back of the head is correctly reconstructed as wider than the tip, the snout is too short and it likely would have had lips covering its teeth. The weird ridges over its eyes should be flatter on the head and form small bumps over the eyes. The nostrils are also now thought to be lower down on the end of the snout than is shown here. The tongue also seems to move, whereas sauropods are now thought to have been incapable of doing so. It also probably didn't roar, but rather used low frequency rumbling sounds with its mouth closed that would travel further. So the iconic scene of it roaring and spitting at the camera may not be accurate sadly. The skin texture shows really large scales, whereas the real animal likely had smaller scales that would have made the skin look leathery from a distance. The body is also just way too skinny. Tyrannosaurus is thought to have been an incredibly muscular animal, and essentially the entire body needs to be beefed up. As such, the weight estimate of 5 tons is now thought to be on the light side, and most mass estimates are closer to 8 tons. It also has the typical theropod wrist pronation problem. The assertion that female tyrannosaurs were larger is no longer supported. This claim was based on there appearing to be two morphs of Tyrannosaurus, a gracile and robust form. The robust form's hips and tail bones having a wider gap, speculated to have provided room for eggs, suggesting they were female. This has since been disproven and simply seen as individual variation. T-Rex may have been sexually dimorphic, but there is nowhere to prove this as of now. Whilst only referred to as a dromaeosaur in the episode, without a specific genus, the evidence book specifies that this is dromaeosaurus, meaning running lizard. It also points out that dromaeosaurus itself is not native to Hell Creek, but rather older rock units also in Montana, but also Canada, dated from 80 to 70 million years ago, so likely would have been extinct by this time. The model is the same as the Utah Raptor, just with a different colour scheme, and I think I actually prefer it. It is a slightly better match for Dromaeosaurus, but not by much, as Dromaeosaurus had a very low and long skull. So the triangular shape this model has in profile is not the best fit. It was also more heavily built than the more gracile build this model has. Dromaeosaur teeth were known from Hell Creek and were at times referred to Dromaeosaurus, but more complete Dromaeosaur skeletal material has been found since the show aired and have been referred to two new genera, Akiraraptor in 2013 and Dakotaraptor in 2015. Dakotaraptor is a controversial genus, as whilst it was originally claimed to be the second largest Dromaeosaur known after Utah Raptor, it was later shown to be a chimera, as some of the bones used to reconstruct it turned out to be from turtles. Its classification as a dromaeosaur has also been questioned since its initial description. A chiroraptor is only known from the tips of the upper and lower jaws, and they suggest it has a longer, straighter snout than this model has. It should also have a full coat of feathers too, and not be able to pronate its wrists. The ankylosaurus, meaning fuse lizard, is really weird. It pretty much just needs to be flattened. The head, legs, torso, scoots and tail club are all too tall compared to the fossil material. It's also hard to tell if it has a beak, which it should have as an Ornithischian. Whilst it does have the four horns on the back of its head, they're much too round when they should be sharper and broader at the bases. The upper pair should curve upwards at the top and back of the head, and the lower pair should extend further towards the mouth. It's hard to spot, but it has four fingers, when Ankylosaurids had five, with only the Enemos three having claws. It also has four toes. Whilst the feet of Ankylosaurus are incompletely known, most Ankylosaurids had three toes. As for the armor scoots, Ankylosaurus has never been found with its armour in articulation with the skeleton, and so paleontologists have had to speculate how they were arranged on the animal in life. Whilst this was a reasonable arrangement at the time, they're far too uniform by modern standards. 
and there's also just way too many scoots. The most recent reconstruction has far fewer scoots and with wider spaces between them. The neck is now thought to have two blocky half rings with four scoots apiece and be much broader and flatter. The scoots over the rest of the back were also broader at the bases with strongly keeled ridges as opposed to the smoother ridges seen here. They may have had sharper, more triangular scutes on their sides and on the top of the base of the tail, as are known in other ankylosaurs. The tail club is also weirdly knobbly and too bulbous when it should be flatter and smoother. It may also raise its tail higher than the range of motion estimated by biomechanical tests allowed. Recent studies of the genus Zool indicate that the primary purpose of their tail clubs was for intraspecific combat, possibly in dominance displays by males, but there's no reason it couldn't also have been used for defense against predators like tyrannosaurs. Next up we have the Ceratopsian Taurosaurus, which means perforated lizard. It's still a pretty solid model, granted the ornithischian cheek debate still persists. There is a slight issue in that they only have four fingers when they should have five and only the innermost three should have claws and bear weight. Likewise, the back feet do correctly have four toes, but only the innermost three should bear weight. Taurosaurus's head frill and horns show a lot of variation, so it would be kind of pointless to judge their accuracy as they seem well within the realm of possibility. A herd of actual animals would likely have lots of individual variation, but they're likely identical due to production constraints. It's unknown whether they could change the colour of their frills with blood, but this feels more plausible than the Stegosaurus's plates, as Taurosaurus's frill had large fenestrae, which would have been covered in soft tissue. Since the show aired, juvenile Triceratops have been discovered, and based on them, the frills of the juvenile Taurosaurus seen here seem to be much too big, as the fossils show that Triceratops, at least, didn't develop the enormous frill until they were much older, but this wasn't known at the time. Speaking of Triceratops, I wonder if the Triceratops corpse prop indicates that they may have planned to use Triceratops when they originally filmed it, but changed it to Taurosaurus later in production for some reason. My original assessment of the Hadrosaur, a Natatitan, meaning Titanic duck, still stands for the most part. It is now classified as Edmontosaurus a nectetans, but I did miss out a few things, mainly the misleadingly named duck bill of Hadrosaurids. E. anectens did have an extremely long skull, but the bill at the end did not flare out as is shown here, but rather it was a keratinized structure at the end of the snout that deflected downwards. The forelimbs are also probably too bulky. Otherwise though, it's not bad. This episode's pterosaur, Quetzalcoatlus, named after the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl, is extremely problematic and my original assessment still stands. Though there are some other things I forgot to mention. It is described as having a 13 meter wingspan, but most estimates are closer to 10 meters. The fall in proportions look to be too long and the hind limbs are too short. It is pretty doo-doo. As for the minor creatures of this episode, there are quite a few. I still to this day wonder what this weird green theropod carcass is. I assume it's meant to be a subadult Tyrannosaurus, or you know, Nano Tyrannus. Next to it is an unidentified dead mammal, clearly different to Didelphodon. Hal Creek has quite a diverse mammal fauna, so you can basically take your pick. Based on the long bushy tail, I'm gonna guess it's Purgatorius. You briefly see a butterfly feeding on a diverse range of flowering plants. Moss is live acted by, I believe, a modern great Mormon. Butterflies are suspected to have first appeared in the Cretaceous based on molecular clock analyses, diverging from more basal moths, though the oldest known fossil butterfly is dated to 56 million years ago. There are also unseen birds that sing amongst the trees. These are most likely Avisaurus, as they're known from Hell Creek, and opposite birds like them were the dominant arboreal birds in the Cretaceous, whilst the ancestors of modern birds were more terrestrial and aquatic. This may have been what allowed them to survive the extinction, as the trees opposite birds depended on were destroyed, so the surviving modern birds then filled the arboreal niches left vacant by their passing when the trees recovered. 
there's an unnamed ornithopod that briefly gets chased by a dromaeosaurus. I'm guessing these must be Thesalosaurus, as they're the only animal from Hell Creek that fit. The model is identical to that of the Lealinosaurus, and even the colour scheme was directly reused for the Othnelia in Big Al, though that animal is now known as Nanosaurus. The evidence book refers to this crocodile as Dinosuchus, meaning terrible crocodile, but even it points out that it is not known from Hell Creek, and was likely already extinct by this time. It also points out that it was reconstructed more like a crocodile, when it was more closely related to alligators, and therefore should have a much broader snout. Interestingly, there was a crocodilian present in Hell Creek that weirdly fits both the size and snout shape of this creature, Thoracosaurus, related to the modern Garial, so maybe this is what this animal is meant to be, albeit probably by accident. We briefly see a snake, live acted by a modern red-tailed boa, watching the Tyrannosaur chicks. This animal was referred to as Dinolycia on the old Walking with Dinosaurs website, but that genus lived in Argentina 85 million years ago, so would never have appeared here. A fitting replacement would be the genus Cerberophis, a basal snake of unknown affinities. Whether the heat-sensing pits had evolved by this time is unknown though. Indeterminate Boid fossils are apparently known from Hell Creek, the oldest known in fact, so maybe this is what this animal is. I think Death of a Dynasty is still my personal least favourite episode, but it's still wonderfully done. I just don't really like many of the models in this episode, and the tone is a bit grisly for my liking, but still very well put together. Alright, and I think that just about covers everything I wanted to talk about in this more thorough revisit to my favourite paleontology documentary ever made. Walking with Dinosaurs remains as wonderful as it always was. It is of course heavily dated now, 25 years later, but that's a good thing, as it means our knowledge of the geological past has expanded greatly over the last two and a half decades. I'd like to dedicate this video to two absolute legends that worked on the original series that we sadly lost earlier this year. They are Mike Milne, the founder of Framestore's animation department that decided to take on the series, who led the team that created the beautiful visual effects, and Jez Gibson Harris, the creative director of Crawly Creatures, the ones responsible for creating the incredible animatronics and puppets seen throughout the series. I give my sincerest condolences to their loved ones and hope they rest assured knowing their work positively impacted the lives of millions in bringing the lost worlds of our planet's ancient past to life on our screens. May they rest in peace. And thank you so much for watching. Bye bye now.